Okay, so welcome to this fourth video on Long QT Syndrome. So in this video, what we're going to do is we're going to see what Long QT Syndrome is, we're going to see how mutations in channels can cause Long QT Syndrome, and then we're also going to see, um, we're going to see how um, other mutations, for instance, mutations in this ACAP9 or, um, or YOTIO, um, the OTO protein, how those can lead to long QT syndrome as well. So let's start off with what long QT syndrome is. So basically we have seen the normal cardiac action potential here has this very familiar shape. Basically if you have got long QT syndrome then your cardiac action potential is too long. Uh, namely the plateau phase lasts for too long. So let me show you what long QT syndrome action potential would look like. It would go on for longer like this before you get that repolarization. So uh, this too long action potential here, this is long QT basically. So long QT is this long QT syndrome. You have a too long uh, cardiac action potential. Right, okay, so what causes long QT syndrome? Well, basically, it's mutations in these delayed rectifier potassium channels over here. Because remember, what causes this repolarizing uh, portion of uh, the cardiac action potential? It's that the voltage-gated calcium channels here in pink start closing. Their conductance starts going down. So that means the movement of positive charge into the cell gets smaller. And meanwhile, the delayed rectifier potassium channels, their conductance of potassium out of the cell is going up. So the movement of potassium out of the cell is going up. So the movement of positive charge out of the cell is going up. So that means that overall, the net movement of positive charge is going to favor uh, the outward movement, and it's going to get more outward, if you like. So, uh, that therefore causes this repolarizing uh, phase of the action potential, or phase 3, because you're moving positive charge from the intracellular to the extracellular compartment. That's going to reduce the electrical potential of the intracellular compartment and raise the electrical potential of the extracellular compartment, uh, which will um, move, uh, well, it's going to mean that the electrical potential difference from uh, the extracellular to the intracellular compartment, i.e. how much different the intracellular the electrical potential is compared to the extracellular electrical potential, it's going to get more negative, i.e. you're going to get repolarization here. Now, if you have mutations in these, uh, in these voltage-gated potassium channel subunits, for instance, if you have a mutation in this KCNQ1 protein, which is this one of these key components uh, which makes up um, the KCNQ1 potassium channel, or indeed if you have mutations in KCNE1, uh, which is this uh, single uh, membrane spanning protein here, which also uh, forms a part of that subunit of the KCNQ1 channel. Uh, either of those can lead to uh, dysfunction of this channel and reduced conductance. Now if the potassium conductance is reduced, then uh, the movement of positive charge out of the cell is going to be lower. So it's going to take longer, basically, uh, for you to uh, get a movement of potassium out of the cell that is greater than the movement of calcium into the cell. And that's why it's going to delay uh, this repolarizing portion. Similarly, uh, if you have mutations in KV11.1 uh, subunits, which form these homotetramers, uh, which form voltage-gated potassium channels, if you have mutations in those which lead to reduced conductance, then again, it's going to mean that um, the repolarization phase is going to be later, basically. Uh, and I don't think KV1.5 has been identified in long QT uh, yet, uh, but KV11.1 and KCNQ1 um, and uh, KCNE1, they most definitely have been mutations in those are associated with long QT syndrome. Okay, so now let's talk about this ACAP9 and what it has to do with long QT syndrome. Okay, so let's go down here and talk about AK and ACAP9. Okay, so this protein, it all starts basically with this protein KCNQ1 and KCNE1 forming this KCNQ1 voltage-gated potassium channel. So let's draw our KCNQ1 
voltage-gated potassium channel, which, remember, consists of these four subunits, which I'll draw like so. Uh, and each one of these subunits basically consists of a KCNQ1 protein with a KCNE1 protein. Okay, so these are the four subunits. Right, so... Um, let me colour them in. So this is our KCNQ1 channel now. Um, I should have drawn it in the coloured it in the same colour as before, but I've lost that blue pen since using it to write one QT. This place, oh, I found it again now. But never mind. I've started with green, so I will continue on. Okay, so this is our KCNQ1 channel. Okay, so it sits in the cell membrane like so. So here is the phospholipid bile there, like so. And this is the KCNQ1 channel. It's the KCNQ1 channel. Right. Okay. So basically, what happens is that KCNQ1 is attached to an A kinase anchoring protein. So let's draw it here. And this A kinase anchoring protein is massive, and it's attached to absolutely loads of other proteins. And this A kinase anchoring protein is specifically a kinase anchoring protein 9, or ACAP9, short. It also has another name, uh, so you might also see this protein referred to as YOTIO, so YOTIO, like that. Okay, so ACAP9, or YOTIO, uh, binds to this KCNQ1 channel on the intracellular side, so this is the cytosolic side here, cytosolic. Um, and this is obviously the extracellular domain over here. Now, ACAP9 also binds to a bunch of other things which are important. Basically, it's going to bind to a, um, it's going to bind to the regulatory subunits of a protein of a type 2 protein kinase A, basically. So where should I draw this uh, type 2 protein kinase A? Um, I'll draw it here. All right, so remember protein kinase A in its inactive state, it is in these R2C2 complexes. And don't confuse that for R2D2. Uh, this is R2C2 complexes, where you have two regulatory subunits here. So I'll colour those in. Uh, so this is a regulatory subunit. These subunits here are regulatory subunits. Let me just finish this off. OK, so those are both regulatory subunits. And I'm not sure if if I do this, whether the um, division between the two will be so obvious. Right, okay, so those are both regulatory subunits, and they've dimerized, basically. So this is, uh, because it's a type 2 protein kinase A, this is the R2 regulatory subunit, so R2 in Roman numerals, like so. So that's the R2 regulatory subunit, and basically, when uh, these R2 regulatory subunits have no cyclic AMP bound to their cyclic AMP binding sites, they bind the catalytic subunits of protein kinase A. So here is two catalytic subunits of protein kinase A. And they also bind to ACAP9. Now, when cyclic AMP comes and binds in these four binding sites for cyclic AMP, that's going to trigger a conformational change of both of these R2 subunits, and um, they will change conformation and they'll release these catalytic subunits of protein kinase A, and those catalytic subunits will come and phosphorylate the KCNQ1 channel. So another important protein that's attached to ACAP9 is, you've guessed it, it's adenylalcyclase. So here we have adenylalcyclase, so I'll draw an adenylalcyclase in. Right, okay, like so. And basically, the adenylalcyclase that you usually find attached to uh, ACAP9 is adenylalcyclase 2. So basically, uh, adenylalcyclase 2 will produce the cyclic AMP. That will go and bind to R2, the cyclic AMP binding domains of these R2 sub uh, regulatory subunits here. Those will change conformation and release the catalytic subunits. So we've got a nice sort of, all of the relevant um, relevant proteins are nicely sort of um, collected together. And now, uh, just to finish it off, you also have another protein bound over here. And this, we've got the, um, we've got how you're going to make the signal. This is our adenylalcyclase 2 here. That will make the signal. Now we need what will terminate the signal. And this is phosphodiesterase, and it's of type 4. Specifically, it's of type 4D. 
Uh, so uh, remember, of the phosphodiesterases, they are there are many, many different types of phosphodiesterases. They're split into 11 different families. Phosphodiesterase 1 family, phosphodiesterase 2 family, all the way down to the phosphodiesterase 11 family. Now, in each of those families, there are many different genes. So in the phosphodiesterase 4 family, there are actually four different genes. Phosphodiesterase 4A, phosphodiesterase 4B, phosphodiesterase 4C, and phosphodiesterase 4D. So this is a specific gene, which is then encoded for a specific phosphodiesterase enzyme. Right, now it gets even more complicated than that because I'm going to put a free here. And what that denotes is the third splice variant. So phosphodiesterase 4D is a specific gene which codes for a polypeptide. So this is a specific uh, combination of amino acids, but there are different splice variants of the genes. So there are different uh, combinations of exons that you can actually include in the production of this protein. So this is the third splice variant. So ACAP9 specifically specifically associates with phosphodiesterase 4 D, the third splice variant, gene D of the, and the third splice variant of gene D, basically. Okay, so this is go then going to break down the cyclic AMP that this adenylyl cyclase 2 makes, and it will terminate the signal, basically. It will return the regulatory subunits to their original conformation, and the catalytic subunits will then come back and bind to those R2 subunits. So this over here, just to remind you, this is the R2C2 complex, and the reason it's called that is that you have two regulatory subunits dimerized together and two catalytic subunits held in that dimer. Right, so basically what can happen is you can get mutations in this uh, A kinase anchoring protein 9, or YOTIO, and if you get mutations in that, which result in KCNQ1 channel no longer being bound to this, then that can result in non-QT syndrome. So if you get a mutation, maybe somewhere around here, uh, which results in the ACAP9 no longer binding the KCNQ1 channel, uh, then uh, what that leads to is long QT syndrome. So it leads to basically dysfunction of this channel, just the same as if you'd had a mutation in the channel. And what's believed to underlie that dysfunction is that you are no longer um, you're no longer regulating that channel's function with your uh, with your protein kinase A enzymes. Basically, these catalytic subunits of this protein kinase A R2C2 complex, when they're released, they will go and phosphorylate serine and threonine residues in this KCNQ1 channel, and they will modulate its function, increasing its conductance, potentially. And if you uh, mutate this uh, binding domain on ACAP9 for the KCNQ1 channel, what happens is the KCNQ1 channel won't anymore be bound to that ACAP9, and uh, it means that this KCNQ1 channel will no longer be being activated by the catalytic subunits of protein kinase A, basically. So what this highlights, really, is the importance of local signaling structures. So having these proteins all, which are involved in this signaling pathway all really close together. And it's really all about um, what it indicates for me is, pharma, is maturity with regards to biology. So realizing that when you activate protein kinase A, you don't activate it in the entire cell. You activate it in local little micro domains of the cell, and it will activate things that are local to that, but not the whole cell. You know, you don't activate protein kinase A everywhere. And if for some reason the KCNQ1 is no longer included in this little signaling micro domain, then it won't be activated by protein kinase A, and that can be detrimental to its function and result in long QT syndrome.